Happy Monday, friends. It is once again Mondays with Mark. Mark Claire Mondays here at the Mark Claire Show. And uh, this past Friday, just a couple days ago, I did this one live for patrons, uh, subscribe star people, all you people who support me. You can find out all the methods, including Rockfin, over at markclair.com, M A R C C L A I R.com. Did this one live with my man Chris Knowles of the Secret Sun blog. We broke down Rihanna's Super Bowl occulty halftime show and the history of these halftime shows and how they have really become occult rituals. Before we get into that, I got to tell you about this fantastic coffee that I am drinking right now from my man, Stephen Fox at Fox and Sons Coffee. Check it out at foxandsons.com, F-O-X, the letter N, S-O-N-S.com. So many great things about Stephen Fox. First of all, he's been a guy who's been following me for years from Lions of Liberty, carried over here to the Mark Claire Show, and he supported us in, a, in a various forms uh, over that time. And now he's official first sponsor of this show. Much appreciation to Stephen for that. But turns out, by luck would, as luck would have it, this coffee is amazing. I literally now have the subscription. Every single month, I got a two-pound bag of the Den Blend Dark Roast, and I love it. Starts me off every single morning. Gives me the energy I need to do two-hour live streams like I ended up doing uh, with Chris Knowles today. You'll get about an hour or 20 of that on the main show. The rest is for the patrons, the premium subs in the smoke-filled room segment. But you got to check out this coffee. If you enjoy the show, if you like coffee, I ask you to just do one thing. Just give it one shot. Head over to foxandsons.com. Use my discount code, which now gets you 18% off discount code MCS think Mark Claire show discount code MCS gets you 18% off. Just try a bag. You're not going to regret it. And you'll support a sponsor of the show. You'll support the show. It's just wonderful all around. Speaking of wonderful, I think you're going to find my conversation today. Very wonderful with the great Chris Knoll. My guest today is the author of several books, including Our Gods Wear Spandex, The Secret History of Comic Book Heroes, a personal favorite of mine. He is the proprietor of the Secret Sun blog and uh, the head professor, the dean, whatever you might want to say, at the Secret Sun Institute of Advanced Synchro Mysticism. That is a fun word to say. I'm very pleased to welcome Chris Knowles. Chris, welcome to my show. Thank you, Mark. Glad to be here. And, uh, you know, Chris, you and I spoke just about a year ago um, on a different show in my in my past life. So this is a new show, new audience. So I'll let you just do a quick little bio of yourself. And why don't you just tell us really how you came became interested in uh, what you sort of investigate now, which is uh, the occult um, symbology, that sort of thing, and what you do over at the Secret Sign blog. Well, I um, have a long history of working in uh, art and media advertising, all these kind of things. I learned from the inside how messages are constructed, how narratives are shaped, uh, you know, sitting in on meetings, sales meetings, packaging meetings, seeing how things are packaged, seeing how ideas and messages are presented to the public. You know, this is something I've been doing basically since I was in high school. Um, so I worked as a graphic artist for 35 years. Uh, I did a lot of uh, toy packaging. And then for, gosh, for the past for 15 years, I did a lot of work for Marvel Studios, for the movies and so on, uh, working on all the you know artwork for the characters, for the merchandising and so on, which is the real gravy of that business. Uh, it's a little secret that people don't realize that the, the real money in those movies comes from lunchboxes and t-shirts and all that kind of thing so anyhow so i'm um, just working uh i worked for a few years for um a magazine called classic rock which is one of the big glossy uh rock magazines i did the actually the best-selling issue ever that magazine i did a cover issue on jimmy page and lucifer rising interviewed uh bobby Bosley from prison interviewed kenneth anger which was uh which was an experience um that i worked for um as an associate editor for a number of years and feature writer interviewer for comic book artist magazine, which is a Eisner award five time Eisner award winning magazine, um, uh, on comics and so on. So, like I said, I've had sort of a backstage look, like literally backstage look, cause I grew up, my mother was a professional musician. So I, I literally, you know, I spent a lot of times in nightclubs and concert halls and all those kind of things. So I really got a chance to see, you know how the sausage is made so to speak uh back in the 80s i worked well i didn't work i volunteered as a, as a roadie for my friends hardcore bands back in the early 80s hardcore scene and just saw um how the the 
music industry worked, even at that level, uh, as far as the clubs and so on. So I've always had sort of like an inside look uh, behind the scenes at how all these messages are shaped and formed. And it wasn't really until I was working in New York that I began to see all this mythological imagery just basically everywhere. Um, there are neighborhoods in, in Manhattan that just are almost like open air pagan temples, you know, particularly like Murray Hill and Midtown and so on up near the UN uh, Grand Central Station, obviously. Um, there are all these like strange apartment buildings in New York that are, you walk into the lobbies and you, you think you're in like ancient Rome and like, you know, the Temple of Dionysus or something. So I saw, you know, I just spent a lot of time walking the streets in New York and just seeing just that, that the old gods were not dead in some people's minds. A lot of people's minds, they were very much alive. So um, things for, I guess, for a lot of people and for myself, um, coalesced around 9-11. And uh, same time uh, as around 9-11, my, my third child was born. Um, I, I got a, um, <laughs> I got an iMac with a um, 55K modem and I thought I was like, uh, you know. Highfalutin. And, yeah, I thought I was a you know, high octane rocket ship kind of deal, <laughs> right? I And I had a lot of time off since everything just sort of ground to a halt around 9-11 and I just really mm -hmm. started doing a lot of really serious digging. And all that work post 9-11 really sort of led to the work that I did. I mean, it led to our gods wear spandex. And again, I mean, guards wear spandex was very much like an insider's view because I was working in the comic book industry in high school. I was working for a um, chain of stores called New England Comics, uh, pretty well known because they published the Tick comics. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. the Tick. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I just had a look, you know, I just had a sort of a vantage point that allowed me to see, again, how narratives are shaped. And I just started putting all these pieces together. And and really, like I said, that the the jump start was 9-11 because I was working, this is a true story, I was working in Lower Manhattan like pretty constantly throughout August and early September. And when I wasn't working, I was working for um, a production house on Lafayette Street. And then when I wasn't doing work for them, I was... Um, on South End Avenue at my friend's apartment, we were working on a movie script. So around that period of time, I was like, that was my landscape every day. And it was weird because for some reason I wasn't in New York that Tuesday, even though all my friends were like everybody, practically everybody I knew was friends with was in New York that day. And they all had 9-11 stories. And I, you know, I woke up at 11 because my wife goes, oh, you got to come downstairs. You got to see what's going on on television. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's a real, it was a real game changer for me. Um, you know, even though at the same time I was working, doing uh, at the time I was, I was actually working for Nabisco, Craft Nabisco, and doing a lot of um, sales presentations and everything like that. And you know, you could just see the the walls come down. Like all of a sudden, there was like all these security guards all over the place and police and armed police it's like yeah i'm sure the terrorists want to come out to east hanover new jersey and uh, bomb the uh the nabisco um offices <laughs> people were just and people just lost their minds right i mean you remember those days i don't know how old you were but uh no i was i was uh 21 when when 9 11 happened so yeah I, I yeah was yeah enough. yeah yeah so there you go i mean i was 35 so yeah i remember that pretty well um but anyway, so I started doing the blog, The Secret Sun, to sort of expand on the ideas of Our Gods Were Spandex because the publisher really didn't have a very good promotion or sales force to push the book. I mean, the book ended up doing, I mean, I still get royalty checks from that book. It's, it still sells. But, um, you know, I had to do a lot of the promotional work for it myself. And the work that I was doing, you know, in the early days, if you go to the blog and just go back to 2007, you'll see it's all our gods were Hispanic stuff. And then eventually I just start morphing into this, you know, all my other interests as far as mythology and ritualism and the occult and all these kind of things, these messages that are, we're just bombarded with. 
mm-hmm. on a constant basis in the media, you know, and, and early on in the blog's history, I was doing like the Super Bowl stuff. So yeah, uh, all, all of so that, all of that background, um, all, all of that background of yours is, is why you are the perfect person to, uh, to dive into this stuff. Not just cause you've done a lot of looking at these Super Bowl performances in the past, but just, uh, your background in the music industry and, and really seeing the behind the scenes of, of kind of what goes into a presentation to the public. Um, none of the, none of this stuff is random, nothing that, you know, no performance, no, no imagery. It's not just like an artist saying, Oh, put these seven things in there. Cause they look cool. There are, there are meetings, there are human beings or maybe something more deciding what's going to go in this stuff. Um, uh, before we dive into this particular super bowl, this performance from Rihanna from a pregnant, interestingly pregnant Rihanna, um, I'm curious. I just wanted to get a little bit more, more of a, a background on, on how these, I mean, essentially these are the largest viewed concerts. This is the largest viewed concert of the year, every year I, I would have to imagine. And it is something that is very quite obviously to some of us, I guess, become uh, the, the largest annual occult ritual viewed by the most people. So maybe you can just dig generally a little bit more into how these Super Bowl halftime shows have sort of become these occult rituals over time. <clears throat> well, the turning point was really the year 2000. Um, I went back and when I, I did a big presentation for my Patreon for the SSI, for the Secret Sun Institute of Advanced Synchromysticism, uh, on Super Bowls and Super Bowl symbolism and performances. And it wasn't really until, I mean, it started off where it was just like marching bands and so on. And then you had like these sort of, I don't know, like old Brad Packers or something, you know, like these, it was always like a place for has been stars to sort of show up and do their little old hits, you know, their, the old hit parade. Um, and even up until the 1990s, it was, it was all very innocuous and inoffensive. But what happened in the, in the year 2000 is that Disney took the reins, um, mm. And the first image that they flash is, of course, you know, Mickey as the sorcerer's apprentice. So, you know, it's already showing you straight off the bat that you're getting, you know, you're going to get a good dose of it. Um, And they had they had this. It was the ostensible purpose of it was to promote the Lion King. Right. And I guess the Lion King Broadway play. And they had these like hideous puppets. It, like none of it had anything to do with like the Lion King movie. It's just like you're watching. It's like, what am I looking at? You know, ostensibly it's supposed to be sort of like African tribal stuff, but it all looks like, I don't know. It looks like futuristic science fiction, demonic weirdness. And it's just so incongruous. And it, it just seemed like there was a huge paradigm shift behind the scenes. You know, and listen, I, I worked a lot for for Disney for a long time. I mean, I remember going out to um, to Burbank to their offices. So there's always like, oh, well, this sort of slipped by us. We we didn't notice this, right? And it's and, you know, getting to what you're saying that these things are all like orchestrated to the very last detail. I mean, I remember there's a, there was a room in the art department at Disney in, in Burbank where they would have these huge, like those huge lidded, uh, lighted uh, magnifying lenses. You know, those things are sort of like on a, it's almost like on a, a gooseneck kind of situation. And it's like this big disc with a, you know, I mean, just the magnification was uh, incredible. Right. And they're just sitting there like studying every square right. millimeter of every product they were putting out, right? And then they'll say, "Oh, I, I don't know how this cloud penis got into the Lion King." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so just it's just like us. It's to slip through the cracks. It's just like nonsense. I mean, it's just like anything that is placed in that context is placed there, in, you know, intentionally. And then when you start to sort of apply that same principle to everything else that is broadcast, you know, that we're pummeled with that we're entrained with on on a constant basis, you start to realize that this is all intentional. And when you start to, as somebody who had a lot of knowledge and study of ancient mythology and the, the mystery religions, and more importantly, the state cults and the state cult rituals, like these massive um, parades and festivals that the Romans would have, you know, that's really the model that the Super Bowl is sort of running from. And, and actually very explicitly in 2012 with the Madonna thing where it's like 
Roman Egyptomania, you know, because it's sort of like all the costumery and the, the presentation and the dancing and everything that you see is sort of like Roman, but also, you know, Egyptomaniacal, you know, it's like because mm. Egypt was a huge thing, you know, e Egyptian art, Egyptian cults, you know, everything Egyptian was huge. There was a real mania for it in ancient Rome. And you just see that played out like right in front of you. I mean, how aware are all the performers of it? Probably not much, you know. Um, but one thing that really happened, so I told you that the, the, the turning point was really 2000. And it wasn't consistent, you know, it was sort of on and off. It, it really picked up steam in 2010. And I'll tell you what happened then. But um, at the same time, 2000, year 2000, there was a, a huge production that was taking place in London that nobody's ever heard of. And I, I keep telling people about it and they're like, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. It was called the Millennium Dome Show. And this was basically the British government's, you know, mm -hmm. ringing in the new millennium, the Y2K. They built this huge dome that later became the O2 arena. And they had all these uh, displays and stuff, but they also had this show that took place. I think it was like the performance was put on three times a day. And it was basically sort of this like Cirque du Soleil um, performance, you know, with the, the, the all the dancers and stuff on the wires and so on. But it was also like this whole idea of like, it was based on the marriage of, of heaven and hell by William Blake. And then there's the, um, the Tower of Babel is destroyed, you know, 999 times throughout the year. And also um, the, the text itself is about like the sky people, you know, these sort of red sky demons that find the, uh, come to earth and find the, the daughters of men to be attractive and, and comely. And just then, typical you know, fun celebratory stuff, you know? Yeah, that has like, yeah. what the hell does this have to do with like <laughs> London and England, you know, the, the British Empire ringing in the new millennium? Well, it's because it's, you know, at the very highest levels, it's their religion. And the whole, it all sort of culminates with this like new hybrid race, you know, the new human alien hybrid race or the new demonic, you know, it's like the new Nephilim, right? Mm -hmm. And so many of the ideas that were developed, you know, I see this sort of as beta testing for all the things that we've seen since during like all the Olympic ceremonies and during a lot of the award ceremonies and obviously during the Super Bowl, right? things really changed in 2010 when this guy, this Hamish Hamilton, this British uh, director was hired and he's produced or he's directed all the Super Bowl ceremonies since the half times and so on. But he also in 2012 did the uh, notorious London Olympics uh, opening and closing ceremonies with this guy, Mark Fisher, who was responsible for the um, Millennium Dome show. So all the symbolism that we see where it's mixed in sort of the occult but you know these mythological elements mm. and then sort of like the transgressive sexuality and so on really starts to take flight uh around that time of course a little bit early we had janet jackson you know the um infamous wardrobe mm -hmm. malfunction you know when she exposes one breast and again if you when you start to understand that all we're seeing is all this sort of ancient symbolism being repackaged for the masses. Uh, you know, the exposed breast, I mean, that's very common among many depictions of ancient goddesses, Demeter, Isis. Oh, so you don't think that was a you don't think that was a slip? <laughs> that wasn't an that wasn't a nip slip? It, no. It was all part well, of the plan. the other thing the other thing too is that she had a like, little shuriken on her nipple there, right? And it was an mm -hmm. eight pointed star, and that's the you know the eight pointed star of Ishtar. But they also the eight pointed star is the quarters and cross quarters, you know, the um, solstices and equinoxes, but also, you know, in bulk and, and Beltane and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, Lunas uh, or Lamas, as it's also known, and of course, uh, Halloween. So um, you start to see the symbolisms incorporated into these presentations uh, more and more explicitly more and more explicitly. Uh, you had mentioned the Rihanna one. And, um, you, you know, as, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, oh, she's doing the Scarlet Woman, you know, because she's all mm -hmm. decked out in Scarlet. And Rihanna, I mean, 
in case that sounds like a and little that, bit of a what is the symbolism for, for those that might not be aware of this stuff because we, we toss a lot of stuff out here um like what is the significance of the scarlet woman well the scarlet woman is uh mystery babylon the great um mother of harlots from revelation 17 and this was a figure that was obviously um important to a lot of uh, people in the sort of the Crowleyan tradition, sort of the OTO, Thelema lineage, uh, Parsons and Hubbard, for instance, were very much attracted to this character. And, you know, we see, we've seen variations of it before. Um, you know, I, I did a sort of a big post uh, thread on Twitter detailing you know the whole uh, the situation in 2015 with Katy perry and Katy perry comes in you know riding the beast ultimately mm -hmm. this is stellar symbolism because um <clears throat> the mystery babylon the mother of harlots and so on is actually the constellation coma berenice which sort of sits it sits atop leo and if you look at modern depictions it's depicted as a wig because there's this whole backstory where Coma Berenice was the queen of Egypt and she was, you know, sacrificed her hair to Aphrodite so her husband would be victorious in battle, blah, 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 blah. But in the ancient world, it was depicted as uh, Isis and Horus. So, um, you know, that symbolism just, um, I don't think a lot of people even understand, you know, the stellar aspect of it, but it, it obviously, like I said, is important to people in that, ilk that sort of occult black magic the lima that whole tradition that whole lineage um obviously you know because crowley spelt the name b-a-b-a-l-o-n babylon um so that's that's really what i saw i mean the first like the first minute she appears on screen i'm like yeah because <laughs> she's got She's, she's all dressed up in scarlet, right? And she's got like all the jewels and everything, all the jewelry. But she's, you know, ostensibly pregnant, right? Now, the and, thing and, that I... and pretty pregnant too. I mean, she looks to me to be about five or six months in. So it's, it's obviously there was awareness of this going into this behind the scenes. I don't know if anybody else knew she was pregnant, really. I, probably some some people, but the, the general public certainly didn't. So I think for most people, you would think like, why, if you knew your six months, like, why would you want to do this? So, but clearly this was intentional. I mean, not, not necessarily her being pregnant, but clearly having her perform while pregnant. Well, just go back and look at the history. You know, Rihanna's sort of been used as a paper doll for sort of these occult fashion gurus. Because high fashion has really been the venue that a lot of occult symbolism has been fed into the public for the past 20 years now. Uh, it, a lot of it has been fed through um, Fashion Week, you know, whether it's in New York or Milan or Paris or whatever. It's all been seeded through stars like Rihanna, particularly Rihanna. I mean, she she has been like, you know, like I say, a paper doll for these uh occults in trainers so in that context you know on the face of it if you just came in with no context with no history with no understanding of of the symbolism and this you know the history of these halftime shows and the purpose of them it would seem like almost kind of innocuous right mm -hmm. um you know there's rihanna um seems to be very pregnant and is um lip syncing extremely badly oh and yeah I, that's that really stood out to me on this one too i mean they're all, yeah. i think they're usually lip syncing but this one it, it seemed like she wasn't even really caring too much if, if we if, if it was very obvious she looked really high to me so something she looked kind of like in a in well in a trance of sorts so maybe maybe that's uh more true than than it than we might think but again, I mean, time, what I saw, so the, the woman in the sky and, you you know, they do this a lot where they make sort of the, you know, if they have these fans holding up these little lamps or whatever, and, you know, with the, the camera and so on, it looks like it's all set in the heavens. You know, and the mm -hmm. most obvious example of this would be, you know, the beginning of Lady Gaga's performance in 2017 when she's on the roof of this stadium and the stars and everything where it's all these drones that sort of fall from the sky a la revolution 12. so what i saw you know what i saw and what i i wrote about is it seemed to me that it was the scarlet woman from revelation 17 sort of usurping the place of the rebel of the uh woman 
the pregnant woman in, in um, uh, Revelation 12, which if you can wind the clock back a few years back to, to 2017, was the whole, um, the alignment, the Sezigi in um, Leo and Virgo, which a lot of people were connecting to, um, you know, the woman clothed with the sun and, and so on and so forth. So I, I, that's kind of how I saw it. It's, 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 it's classic inversion where you take um you know something from christian tradition you know the, the woman in the stars revelation 12 clothed with the sun and so on and um replace her with this woman in scarlet right and again it's a, it was very subtle it's the kind of thing where people are going to be like well you know what the hell are you talking about and and if you don't have the background if you haven't seen these things just play out over and over and over and over and over and over again or you, you, your attention has been called to it. You might think, oh, whatever. You know, it's just, it's, it's very bland and nonsensical. But that's that's sort of the takeaway that I had because that is, uh, to me, is consistent with a lot of the symbolism that you know we've seen and are seeing. But you know, specifically, when I talked about Katy Perry sort of coming in atop this giant golden beast with the flaming red eyes right uh it was all very um biblical very uh apocalyptic let's just say do you have any thoughts on on the significance of the color scheme the overall color scheme we know we've talked about the scarlet lady aspect but um just her being in the red with all the white dancers around her it was the exact same color scheme that they had last year with the weekend uh, in red and then all his dancers around him were all in white would do you have any thoughts on what the, the significance of that red white contrast is well they they have like you said they have the red a lot you know the scarlet um what, what i saw personally and i haven't done a lot of work on it to be honest with you because i i just sort of saw it and i had my takeaway and there's a lot of sort of further symbolism that just i wasn't too concerned with but what one thing i do see that we've seen for for very many years with a lot of these productions is it's like these dancers being dehumanized hmm. you know what i mean they're not they're not actually human beings i mean back with the um when the black eyed peas performed, they had all these sort of characters, uh, almost like alien characters and like these black body suits with like green lights and so on. And obviously the weekend who you just mentioned with they all had those, the, they had those like eyes wide shut type masks almost. Or even yeah. Like, yeah. Well, it also kind of reminded me of Pink Floyd, the wall. Too. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, was yep. all, it was all very um, depersonalizing and dehumanizing. But, you know, the interesting thing, too, is that, um, you know, this this whole idea of being risen into the heavens, you know, we had or falling from the heavens. So, again, I, I sort of trace this to this obsession with these figures in, in the book of Revelation that we seem to see, you know, the most explicit being Katy Perry. But, you know, Lady Gaga sort of falling from the heavens, you know, she comes down on the wires. But a lot of the choreography and even the sets in Lady Gaga's presentation were very, very similar to the, what I had mentioned before, the Millennium Dome show. And it makes sense because it's sort of coming from the same family of, of producers and so on. I mean, the same kind of people are doing all these different presentations. Um, but, you know, the messaging is is pretty obvious, but there there's also a great deal of gaslighting, too, because... If you're familiar with the symbolism, you're familiar with the mythology behind it, you just go, yeah, there it is. But if you say say that out loud, you know, it's, like, oh, you know, tinfoil hat conspiracy right. theory. You know, it's just like, yeah, shut the fuck up. You know? Well, my, my favorite is that is the, and we'll talk about more of what, what do you think is actually behind why the symbolism is, is in there. But uh, my, my favorite thing is just like, oh, yeah, they're doing it. So you, they put that stuff in there so you conspiracy people will go do videos about it and go do live streams or whatever. But it, to me, it's like, it's so absurd. We're talking about the Super Bowl halftime show. We're talking about like Jay-Z. They don't need like, conspiracy people on, on YouTube to get attention. Like that's not, I, it might make sense if it was someone that was struggling to to make a name for himself. So they do some weird stuff. So maybe some internet person will uh, will talk about them. But it seems absurd when we're talking about billionaires like, like Jay-Z or, you know, people, the people that put on the Super Bowl. 
It, it is. And it's kind of insulting. <laughs> and it's depressing that so many people, normies, so to speak, kind of go along with it. The thing that I found interesting is the way they've sort of scheduled the season so that Super Bowl seems to fall around in bulk. You know, this one of these cross quarter holidays. And it, you know, might not necessarily be in that sort of Celtic tradition, but you know, it seems to be pretty obvious to me that that's what we're looking at here. You know, that that since it falls in those first few days of February, um, that's you know, in bulk in the you know traditionally was anywhere from the first to the third of February, and sometimes it would be all three days. You know, there would be sort of this ongoing because it all had to do with getting ready for the planting season and so on. So I kind of see that, that it, it seems very curious to me that it's sort of set around that cross quarter holiday. And it used to be um, sort of similar with Halloween and, uh, you know, the major league baseball, the world series. Right. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I don't really pay attention. It usually, it usually winds down around the end of October. Yeah. 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 Um, it used to be, uh, well, I think when I was a kid, I just remember that the season would always end on the 2nd of October, but they didn't have like these playoffs that just went on forever. It would be like yeah. each, div you know, it would be the two division winners playing playing off and then you'd mm -hmm. go to the World Series. It wouldn't be like the wild card and, you know, all these, you know, there's three or four different divisions now or something. It's just, it's so, it's so contrived and it's really just to stretch it out for, um, you know, advertising revenue. Yeah. Maybe advertising revenue and maybe the bonus of, oh, we can also center the, the culmination around, around these certain times of year. If you, if you wanted to go, go that way with it. Well, I do. <laughs> yeah. As, as you do. Yes. <laughs> There's yes, no hypothetical exactly. here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, particularly with the Super Bowl. So yeah, if you just look, start to look closely at a lot of these things that we're seeing um, on the Super Bowl, and you have like even just sort of a passing familiarity with the ancient symbolism, it's really not hard to see it play out. The question then becomes like what you asked before is like, why? Mm -hmm. And I kind of see it uh, as sort of a two fisted deal where it's like half of it is religious observance, right? Um, some very strange syncretic hybrid occult religion that I don't think a lot of us are even aware of um and also uh public entrainment you know there was always this kind of idea in i don't know if you go back to like the 80s and 90s where it was like it kind of reminds me of like you know the james shelby downard thing that it was like oh well you know this is going to lead to this <laughs> and and that never does right oh this you know they're doing this because this is going to happen you know next week and next week comes and it never does um, I think that people who make those kind of theories and make those kind of conjectures don't think about the whole idea of entrainment, where morphing and changing the culture and the attitudes and the beliefs of society is not something, you know, that you do in one fell swoop. You know what I mean? It's something that you do over a period of time. You, you know, you'll have these sort of major traumatic events, right? But it seems to be that it's more con a conditioning process, and that's how they're, I they're see. not going to show up one day and um, and and swoop into Christian America and say, "Hey, everybody, we're now doing the new occult religion. So this is our new thing now. Uh, it, it's, it's it has to happen over time to the point that no one no one even thinks they're seeing symbology. They think they're just seeing like this is our culture. This is like there's you know Jay Z does this and it's just normal stuff. There's nothing behind it." Well, I'll tell you something, you know, so I talked about the, the year 2000, but if you really want to go back, um, 1984, uh, Los Angeles Olympics, right? The closing ceremony where they have the giant alien flying saucer sort of send. Again, there's that whole idea of the descent, you know, descending from the heavens. Have you mm -hmm. ever seen that? I don't know if it's still on YouTube. I don't know if I've seen that one. Yeah, that doesn't ring a bell. They have uh, this. So um, this is at Los Angeles Memorial stadium and it was the closing ceremony of the olympics and they had this um this you know flying saucer rig with all the lights and stuff and then they had this like giant like i was like seven feet tall dressed as an alien and he, you know he's addressing 
the stadium. You know what I'm saying? So this is how far back it goes. You know what I mean? It's that would seem to be like that's the earliest example that I can think of at the moment. I'm sure there are probably ones earlier than that. But it's just a great it's a great opportunity when you have all these people gathered or all these people watching these things on television. It's a great opportunity to start broadcasting your messages and start in training people into this this new worldview. And that's really what we're seeing. And it's it's shocking to me. You know, people like your your age and my age, I'm, I'm considerably older than you, but um, I don't know about considerably, like, but <laughs> but like younger people, um, I'm just they just accept it because they don't know anything else. You know, I mean, you have generations that have had like no conventional religious upbringing, right? Um, they have been on the internet since they were born. Okay, they spend all their time on these very nefarious pl platforms like TikTok, right? That are just manipulating them, their minds to the algorithm. So when you combine that kind of manipulation, which is, you know, essentially neurological manipulation, right? You know, it's the whole reward punishment routine, right? It's very, it's almost Pavlovian with these algorithms, right? And then you start to feed in all this satanic and occult and just all this weird symbolism and rituals it's extremely effective and i i think it's just been extremely effective overall i mean like i said if you have knowledge or if you have experience of the world before all this stuff was just bashing you in the face every day you you tend to look askance at it but i, I think that in in they're playing the long game here you know what i'm saying they don't they know that they're not going to change the, the minds of older people they're really after the young and that's why we're seeing all this stuff in the schools now right where this you know doing all this uh you know basically grooming in these schools you know and because they they realize that if they can get people young they've got them for life you know it's like the old um the old jesuit saying you know give me a child until he's eight you know and i'll have the man for life and uh that's basically what we're seeing. Um, so, I, you know, in the long run, you know, I'm quite pessimistic about it. But I also think that we're going to see, we're going to start to see in this, you know, these coming decades, a very similar and analogous situation in America to what Rome experienced in what they called the crisis of the third century. So it was all just like, you know, go, 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 rush, rush, rush grab land, grab land, grab power, grab power, grab people, grab people, all this kind of thing. And then you sort of reach a plateau. And with that kind of effort being made and that kind of program being laid out, you you can't coast. You know what I mean? You have to keep going up or you, you go down. There's, there's, there's only two directions. You know, you know what I'm saying? There's up or down when you're building and, and maintaining an empire. So I think that... Um, it's going to be very interesting because you're going to have people like say on the coasts or in these sort of enclaves with, you know, quote, you know, these quote unquote knowledge workers and so on. And if, if they, if they have any kids, I mean, their birth rates are almost zero at this point, but if they do have any kids, they're going to be entrained into this, this new state cult is, is really how I see it. And, you know, one thing that I've said is that, you know, woke, wokeness is very much sort of the um, the carrier wave mm -hmm. for a lot of the stuff because they're using woke to to sneak in a lot of these kind of ideas. I mean, the, the best example that I can give you offhand, right, is that a, a year or two ago, California, uh, under this whole idea of like, you know, indigenous, indigenous empowerment, wanted school children to pray to like, gods of aztec human sacrifice i mean it was eventually you know it, it was eventually you know it's just a it's it's a cultural diversity you know you have to yeah. embrace these other cultures you know sometimes they worship sacrificial gods well yeah i mean that's kind of what we're seeing so um you know i i think that the empire as it's currently constituted is not going to last too much longer. 
Okay. I think that we're going to start to see tremendous um, dissension in the ranks, so to speak. And we're kind of seeing it on a, on a uh, microcosmic level now because we, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but basically all of, you know, the, the eastern half or maybe even more like using two thirds of Oregon wants to incorporate, wants to secede from Oregon, incorporate with Idaho. Um, and, you know, we've had all sorts of efforts along these lines, you know, what they call Cal exit, um, you know, sort of, I, I think the state they want to create is called Jefferson, which would be like Northern California and parts of Oregon and so on, maybe even parts of, of Washington. So um, it's going to be a very interesting thing, but I mean, I personally don't believe that this whole program ultimately is going to work because it's insane and it's evil, basically. But I think that they there is a very serious desire to, like I said, to condition and to entrain, particularly the young, to sort of accepting this weird, occult, woke, just insanity, you know, this weird kind of... Um, synthesis of terrible ideas that have been proven to fail <laughs> over centuries you know it's like you know we'll be the ones we'll be the ones who make it happen you know I, 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 you know there's always like a generation of people who come up who have had no experience with hardship or reality right and they're going to be the ones you know they're the chosen ones they're the blessed ones that are going to recreate society in their image and uh, it always um, it always ends in utter disaster and calamity. So I have no reason to believe that it won't this time. Well, that could be both good and bad, depending, depending how you look at it. But um, maybe you could dig into a, a little bit more. You mentioned a few times this this sort of new religion. Maybe you can dig into more about what is actually behind that. Who are the people behind it? Is it something they are trying to impose just for? sort of a normal material measures of control or do they actually believe in the religion themselves? Do they actually believe in the power of the symbology that they're putting out there? I, I think a lot of them are true believers. Um, you don't go to that kind of time, effort and expects, expense to um, pull off a hoax. You know, you don't build all these buildings with all the symbolism and all these alignments or put up all these demonic statues. I mean, that's something that I've been looking at recently as well, because of this whole bizarre she demon that they put up. Mm -hmm. Oh in yeah, Madison the one Square. in New York, yeah, yeah in, in Manhattan. Which is actually two she demons, right? Um, I I think it's sort of a melange. I think there are a lot, you know, there are a lot of different interest groups. There are a lot of different belief systems at work. Uh, I you know I think there is a there is some degree of cynicism at play here just people who just you know they just want to control everyone and whatever gets them from point a to point b is is fine by them but i, I think a lot of his true believers and i think a lot of it is based on um what you know what i call watcher worship which is uh, a belief system that sort of came up in the 19th century and was very much promoted by a woman named Alice Bailey, who had a, um, who, or it still exists, an organization that for some reason has, you know, a tremendous amount of money and other resources available and has people like Bill and Melinda Gates giving them all this money and all these different corporations and banks and so on. Um, you know, if you've ever been to one of their little meetings, you're like, what why what's going on here um but if you look at alice bailey's writings um she's very extremely i mean shockingly explicit about worshiping the watcher angels i don't know if all your listeners would be familiar with that but that's this whole this lore that arose out of the book of enoch mm -hmm. uh first enoch but it has also come up before yes yes i mean there's a book in it called you know there's a sub book or you know a subtext in it called um book of the watchers but there's also uh there's book of the giants and book of jubilees mm -hmm. and so on there's all these sort of extra canonical jewish apocalyptic texts that talk about that sort of expand on the idea of the giants 
you know, the Nephilim and uh, the Watcher Angels that sort of, you know, gets glancing mentions in the Old Testament and is very much expanded upon. I mean, none of these books were considered canonical either by uh, Jewish or Christian authorities, even though they were very popular. I mean, there are quotes from Enoch in, in the New Testament, for instance. Um, but there's just this whole idea that <clears throat> there was a war in heaven and there was sort of, it was a civil war between the, the angels who fell or the angels who came to earth and the angels in heaven, right? But the way Bailey and her cult with all their resources and real estate and all the rest of it frame it is that the, you know, the watchers were actually the good guys. It's all a mm -hmm. big misunderstanding. I mean, Enoch had it wrong. You know, it's like these, these angels were assigned by God to, you know, basically sacrifice themselves to come down, you know, to leave their, their perches in, in heaven and paradise, come down to earth so they can bring heavenly enlightenment to the human race. And then there was a, a battle between, you know, the watcher angels, the, you know, the fallen angels and the angels of the heavenly, you know, the celestial court, because they were jealous that, you know, God didn't choose them. I mean, it's, it's like all like, again, it's this whole idea of inversion, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, Bailey's whole idea is that, you know, the watchers are in prison now, but they're going to break out of the prison and they're going to bring, you know, that's who's going to bring in the new age. The new age will be brought by these, you know, these watchers. Um, so it's, it's about essentially returning, returning the old gods, essentially bringing these sort of ancient mythical beings into, into the modern age. Well, see, that's how a lot of scholars, a lot of scholars have seen. So what we had is that we had what was, you know, the Assyrian and the Neo-Assyrian empire. You know, so there's just to give people a little bit of background here. So um, Mesopotamia between the Tigris and the Euphrates has always been like it was basically like musical chairs. Right. So it started off with the Sumerians were kind of ruling the Rus and they were sort of displaced by the, the Akkadians. And then you had the Amorites and the Elamites and all these people sort of just storming back and forth through this, you know, this rich, fertile area between these two rivers. And but around the time that a lot of the books of the Bible were written, you know, the people who were sitting atop the perch were the, ne I think the Neo-Assyrians, right? And they were absolutely the most brutal people that you could possibly imagine. You know, they were just real cruel and, and relentless, you know? Um, they, were, they were eventually displaced by, um, by Cyrus, you know, the Persian Empire. But... Um, they were pretty they were pretty awful so <clears throat> but they were also very technically advanced like they were they were incredible engineers they built these incredible weapons of war and so on so the the thing is uh, um, among scholars that these books about that talk about the watchers and the nephilim and so on in greater detail than you see in the bible are working on what they saw with the neo syrians because the neo syrians were very technically advanced. And then they also worshiped these sort of like what are called Shedu and so on, these sort of winged beings um, that are seen as the, um, and the Apkalo, and are seen as the um, progenitors of, of the Watchers in this whole mythology. But if you read the Book of Enoch, you know, the Watchers come down and they, they give people all this technology. So technology is a huge part of it, right? But it all leads to war. It all leads to just massive war and, you know, the people cry out to heaven, you know, save us from this, this horrible, vicious reign of blood and death, you know, that the watchers have brought upon the earth. And, and that's the reason, that's actually the reason that the watchers are imprisoned. It isn't just because, you know, they're banging hot earth babes, you know, it's because, <laughs> you know, they're, uh, they just bring carnage and destruction to the, to the, to the world. So, the technological aspects of this, I, when all this stuff is kind of revived, you know, as early as I can trace back, like the Watcher cults, but also the Mithraic cults, which I've talked, I don't know if I talked about them on your Yeah, program. we did talk about that back on Lions of Liberty last year. Yeah, but so Mithras is essentially per Persis, right? Perseus. Um, you know, Mithras is Persian, Perseus. It it's basically the same figure. And if you know the, the myths of Perseus, Perseus is given 
it's almost a kind of the same situation with the watchers where Mithras is given basically high technology from the gods, you know, the, the winged sandals and the, sh the sword and the shield and the helmet and so on. These magical, super powered, technologically advanced uh, weapons to defeat the Gorgons and so on. Medusa being, you know, the most well known. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that this was very appealing to like these Masonic groups and these other occult groups in the 19th century, this whole idea of like a technocratic religion almost, right? And I think that, that there's a, a very heavy element of that in what I call the watcher cults, right? And then if you look at the Super Bowl halftimes, you know, um, NFL, Nephilim, right? <laughs> Same oh, difference, man. right? Yeah, man, I, that one never hit me before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because um, Nephilim comes from to fall, the Hebrew or the Semitic to fall. Nephilim, wow. Yeah, and, and it's and NFL basically. <laughs> NFL is the you know where where Nephilim comes from, and of course we have the Titans and the and the Giants and all these uh, teams, right? So um, if you watch those. Super Bowl presentations. I mean, it's always like the latest technology, like latest la laser technology. And here we we saw with the Rihanna halftime show, like these these platforms and so on, but also like the cameras and so on. So it was uh, on the face of it, it's it's simple and innocuous, but it's it is so because it's using or it's incorporating very sophisticated technology. And that's the same thing we've seen increasingly since 2010 when the Who were, were the performers. And they had these um, just these amazing sort of like laser platforms with all this like black sun, black sun and green sun imagery, which is all mm -hmm. sort of things. I mean, the green sun is associated with uh, the god Ra and the black sun is associated with Saturn. Right. So. Um, all this kind of symbology, if you understand where it comes from, it's it's really simple to decode. It's it's just that most people just don't have any knowledge or understanding of where this they're drawing from. And unfortunately, we have a lot of people, I mean, people who I think are well-meaning, but, it, it, you know, very misguided, where it's like, oh, it's satanic, 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 right? Well, you know, I always say, it's yeah, it, it's like small as satanic, right? You know, and then it's like, you know, because I always see like Satan um, in, in the New Testament is, you know, he's a king of the world, you know. I mean, in, in the, in Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness, he's offered all the kingdoms of the world because they all belong to Satan. And Satan is part of the celestial court, as we see in the Old Testament and so on. But um, when they say things like that, they can't ever back it up. Because then they'll throw in all the symbolism that has no connection to Satanism per se. And and people just like, oh, those people are crazy. You know, they just scratch their heads and go, what the hell are you talking about? And walk off. And so much easier to sort of write off, you know, you can summon the the satanic panic or whatever. Oh, it's all those those Christian moralizers just panicking about satanic stuff again. Exactly. But, you know, see, the thing that really I, I came to realize, and this is through, you know, decades of observation. You know, is that Satanism is for the scrubs? You know, Satanism <laughs> right. is for like the losers and the perverts, basically. I mean, if you really kind of look into Satanism, it's just like a, a it's weird kind of thing for losers and perverts, right? And of course, a lot of these designers and producers are perverts, right? <laughs> they're certainly not losers, but they're certainly perverts. A lot of them, right? So that's sort of the appeal there. But there's, you know, there's no. There's no corpus. There's no um, traditional corpus. I mean, Satanism to me is just like it's it's there's there's nothing there. The more you look into it, there the, you know there's no text. There's no tradition. There's no right, temples. Right. There's nothing really there. But like if you talk about like the Watchers, I mean, gosh, we have <laughs> we have all kinds of texts dating mm -hmm. back thousands of years talking about them. Right? right or or Mithras or whatever you know whatever kind of weird kind of cult uh, you know Hecate maybe these you know that's very popular among uh, like Wiccans and so on and yeah. then you have like Dianic Wicca which is very popular with like uh, you know feminist separatists and so on mm -hmm. so like when you just sort of boil everything down to, to Satanism 
and I've been saying this for, for a while, I don't think people really get it. Um, you, you're just begging people to just dismiss you out of hand. You know, people just, they, they know that. They've heard it a million times before. And what they picture is all this Hollywood nonsense, you know, like big red guy with these giant ram's horns and it's all very cartoonish and still which they actually just did at the at the grammys they actually just did the most cartoonish yes. version of that which yes. to me is just like yes it's not even worth being upset about because it's it's just so lame you know it's just so yes. so uncreative and and boring and dumb yes at and least the, all- the super bowl stuff they they get creative with it you know they're they're working it in in a, in a you know what, whatever you think of it it's not lazy uh necessarily but it definitely is with that just the straight up here's satan with his horns <laughs> Well, it's also to me, it's, you know, when I see that stuff, I've been seeing that stuff for many years now. I mean, like, gosh, it was like 10 years ago that uh, Nicki Minaj did that whole thing during the Grammys where she's, you know, in hell and then behind bars. And it's it's all just like so boring. And and just, again, like I said, it's so easy for people to dismiss all that. You know, people can just write it off, you know, because like, you know, you mentioned satanic panic, right? I, one of these days, I'm going to do a real major debunking of that whole meme, the whole meme of satanic panic, because it, I mean, I did, in my book, The Endless American Midnight, uh, the new edition of which is available now at Amazon, um, you know, I, I did take aim at the whole notion of satanic panic, right? And the, th- the thing that I notice increasingly is that the people who bring that up more often than not a Satanist themselves or into Crowley or something, you know, like whatever kind of weird um, occult nonsense that just leaves people isolated and, and lonely. <laughs> you know? and so it's really what it all leads to, you know? And I think a lot of this occult and, and all this entrainment, it's a great way to atomize people. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, I sort of see it that way. And this has been sort of a, a more recent uh, understanding for me that, you know, this entrainment, you know, I talked about this whole idea of entrainment. Well, why would you want to entrain people into this belief system? Well, A, because it makes them um, ruthless and inhumane in their attitudes, which we see. I mean, just go on any social media platform. Uh, you're going to see, you know, people calling for genocide of the, their political enemies all night and day. Um, but it also makes people lonely and stressed out and isolated because, you know, so this is something that I was pointing out in another Twitter thread is that it's all this imagery, it's all um, it's threat. You know what I mean? Like, the, you know, you talked about the color schemes, the black and red. I mean, those are warning colors, aren't they? Right. Yeah. But like, I mean, you in know, nature, the, the poisonous snakes are, are covered in red. Exactly. Exactly. So it's like uh, the black and red and, you know, you know, just stop sign, right? the red, yeah, yeah. Um, but the blood and the snakes and the horns it's screaming, this is something bad. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it screams threat at you. It screams, uh, I think it depresses and demoralizes people hmm. at the end of the day. And I think that's its purpose. I think, you know, so you, you people go, well, what's the purpose of this stuff? Well, it's to entrain people into this worldview that depresses and uh, disempowers them and makes people lonely and barren and isolated, you know? And then, you know, we see all these other things that they're, they're fitting in there. I mean, I'm, I'm actually kind of shocked by how many um, Satanists now are trans, you know, there's this huge overlap between trans and Satanism, but also like this weird, like, trans satanist antifa crossover which is like you know somebody might talk age, about intersectionality that that's, yeah, some, that's some the intersectionality ultimate intersect- right yeah exactly <laughs> which is really uh disorienting to me because i remember like back you know starting back in the 80s whenever i met somebody uh they told me they were like a satanist or into to crowley or something you know i was just waiting for the inevitable oh and i'm also a nazi <laughs> you know I mean? I mean, oh, that was like, that was the old intersection huh yeah that was the old intersection was you know um satanism and nazism which you know and now those same like people Canada, call people nazis when and they don't like them so the whole thing has been flipped around well then not even though i mean they say they're anti-fascist or anti-nazi but their belief systems are all you know entirely uh consistent with you know with fascism you know, and dehumanization and genocide and hatred and division, you know, 
And, no, and, and, when you put it like that, it's a perfect fit with the, the Watcher cult and, and, and everything else. So, Well, see, but here's the thing. I mean, I'm so deep. I'm like just waist deep, maybe even like neck deep in the waters of speculation, obviously, with this stuff, because it's still new to me. I'm still sort of sort of sorting out what this whole Watcher thing was. And it wasn't really until I discovered, like I said, the Millennium Dome show, which is just so explicit, like Genesis 6-4, right? Or Book of Enoch, whatever you want to call it. Um, or even the X Files, right? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, that was my you know, that was a big pill for me. Some kind of pill yeah. For me. So um, you know, I, I think I I think, and this this might sound crazy, but there's always you know these people, you know, the, the corporations and the, the the power interests behind a lot of this um, have if they don't understand the psychology, they have psychologists who you know consult with them or work with them you know sort of explain mass psychology group psychology people are not only like these weirdos like on reddit or something they're going to be interested in satanism you know like i said losers and perverts those are the only people that you're going to find uh interested in satanism i've yet to to come across any person who espouses satanism who isn't one or the other right or but usually both um people are just not going to go for that what what I what I see is the real threat, uh, ostensibly, is again this whole watcher idea that that Bailey in her evil gene well, either she or her you know British intelligence handlers in their in their evil genius were were able to delineate so perfectly, in her early books like uh, Initiation, Human and Solar, and Coming of Cosmic Fire, that you know the watchers the good guys. So what we'll have is that we'll have this whole breakdown. We'll have this whole calamity. You know, the again the um, crisis of the third century, our own crisis of the third century, right? Of, of our own empire, and there'll be this sort of dialectical Hegelian conflict between traditional America and quote unquote new America, and then this all this weird, inter, you know, trans satanic pedophilia, um, you know. I mean, the, the Venn diagram on like trans, Satanism, pedophilia, uh, Antifa, bronies, furries. I mean, it's, it's almost like, it's like a perfect circle, right? right. I mean, th th that's that's not even like, I'm not even making like casting aspersions. It's just a, an objective fact, right? Um, people know that, that that stuff is just going to be repulsive to most people. Mm -hmm. So you sort of set up this dialectical conflict between these, you know, thesis and antithesis. And then the watcher cult comes in and, and sort of saves the day, right? Oh, it's ah. like, well, you, you know, yeah, but okay. So you you don't understand. It's like, you know, we understand that you're you know you're Satanist and all this kind of stuff because you know you you, you in your deep in your hearts you knew that the watchers were the real saviors. You know, the mm -hmm. watchers are are real masters, are real lords and saviors, right? So it's almost like all this other crap that they know people will be repulsed by is pushed down our throats because they know it's going to get that reaction. And that's how you can really bring in what some people might say an antichrist or a, a savior of some kind that can say, look, here's, here's how, look, we know that's bad. Look, but here's, here's, here's your salvation. You know, look at these exactly. guys. Exactly. bring these guys back. Exactly. Exactly. And like I said, if you don't believe me, if you think I'm just blowing smoke and this is just like some wild tinfoil conspiracy theory, just go back and read Alice Bailey's books. And like I said, you know, on the face of it, I mean, I actually, I don't know, I don't know, maybe almost 20 years ago now, I went to one of these great convocations in New York, right? Because I was just, I'd read all this stuff about Alice Bailey and Lucy Trust. I'm like, you know, what's what's really going on here, right? So I went, and I'll tell you something. I, I, I was so bored that I almost jumped out the window because I thought I'm so bored. I'm so incredibly bored. I will never not be bored. Like this, I'm being infected <laughs> with like, you know, the, the virus of just pure boredom for the rest of my life. I mean, luckily I did, you know, just sneak out the door during the, um, the coffee break, but you know, it's just like, why, you know, what's going on here? And it wasn't until I discovered how explicit she is about watcher worship that it all sort of clicked mm -hmm. into place. You know, why are people like Bono and George Soros and Bill Gates and all these kind of people like so interested in the Lucis Trust? You know, why are all these um, NGOs and banks and all these, you know, the whole power structure, why are they feeding this weird little cult money? Why do they have, you know, these big swank offices on Wall Street and so on? Uh, and again, I mean, to me, it's because of, you know, the coming infrastructure, there'll be like the, 
the uh, the hierophants, so to speak, of the Watcher cult. But um, I'm just trying to think what there's just one thought I wanted just uh, before I oh so I talked about the crisis of the third century. Now here's the interesting thing, uh, and this might you know this is a little bit of history nerddom. So Rome had the crisis of the third century, and it was just like I mean they'd have like caesars serving you know for two days before they were assassinated i mean just it was just a total clusterfuck for most of the the, the third century and then this guy comes along called aurelian right and aurelian is like this uh almost like uh norman schwarzkopf kind of character just this total bat like or like Patton or something is a badass neck breaking um general right and he basically pummels the, the the empire back into shape through sheer force of will but one of the tools that he used to do so was the sun cult so before we had the cult of the uh olympians right um juno and 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 jupiter and you know apollo and and mars and so on and so forth but by this point in time, nobody believed that stuff anymore. Nobody was interested in the stuff that more people were all into these, you know, what they called Oriental cults, you know, Isis and uh, Dionysus and all these sort of imports that came in with these this huge populations of slaves and so on. So what Aurelian did, and it was actually kind of genius, is like, well, listen, it's all the sun. You know, the sun is the god. Sun is our, our primary god. Every, everything sort of serves under that. You know, this we're going to start this this cult of Saul, and it can be the one thing that we can all agree on. And, you know, even if you worship, you know, uh, Zalmoxis or uh, you know Demeter or Astarte, or whatever, it, it all sort of it, it all falls under the umbrella of the sun. And actually, this it's not necessarily regarded as such, but it really kind of laid the groundwork for what Constantine would do in the fourth century where he just made the the roman church you know the, the sort of umbrella and basically what mm -hmm. they did is that they just brought in all these other traditions and holidays and festivals and so on mm -hmm. and then christianized them right you know this is something that uh, leo the sixth pope leo the sixth was sort of he sort of made this like state policy but anyway, is that why so we see today with like a lot of this new age stuff is it's not really necessarily all saying reject all these religions it's actually doing the opposite a lot of times you just see like oh all religions are good we can embrace all the religions so is it really that kind of thing like yeah we're gonna you, you can you can all fit under our new age umbrella don't worry it's not you know we're not trying to say you can't believe what you believe you just also do it under under this sort of uh you know vernacular exactly and you know where that came from that came from you know the tradition that alice bailey came from which was theosophy hmm. um you know madame blavatsky wrote um right. Isis Unveiled and the Secret Doctrine, and those books were huge. I mean, people really tend to underestimate how huge Theosophy was. I mean, it sort of crashed and burned in the early part of the 20th century, but it was huge. I mean, and one thing you know, if you've read Our Gods Were Spandex and you've read you know The Secret Sun over the years, um, so 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 much of our popular culture can be traced to theosophy and theosophy basically inspired or influenced you know so many of the people who kind of came up with the early superheroes for instance and uh uh Edgar Rice Burroughs you know who did Tarzan and and Cave Carson and all these kind of characters Pellucidar and so on um it it was all drawing very heavily on theosophy uh you know another great example is lovecraft right mm -hmm. uh hp lovecraft and one thing that i've argued is that all these you know the cthulhu mythos is really watcher um really watcher mythology it's another way of seeding that into the um into the culture because he had a lot of contacts <laughs> i think he was just basically sort of strung along i think that um you know, like uh, Houdini, for instance, who's known to be a British intelligence agent, was, uh, you know, gave him a lot of money to write all these things for him and so on and so forth. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that what you said, you know, what's called, you know, let's like deep, sync, uh, deep, um, it's a you know, it's, it's, it's syncretic, but uh, what's the term I'm thinking of? Um, ecumenical, mm. you know, it's like what they call deep ecumenism, you know what I mean? And uh, 
it could you know very well be that that's what we're sort of lurching towards i mean is it going to be successful can it be successful in in our day and age of rapid fire um communications my guess is that it, it's not you know what i mean i mean but there are so many of these sort of like plans you know these um plans that have been sitting around for 150 years uh you know for one world government and so on that um you know once the rubber hits the road they fall apart well, maybe that's maybe that's the white pill in all this stuff. As as dark as a lot of looking into this stuff can be, uh, and especially with the deeper you get, the deeper you get. Um, there's a lot of dark stuff in there uh, at the end of the day. But maybe the white pill is like, yeah. But this stuff has been around for a long time. People have been writing these books, crafting these plans for a long time. And you know, yeah, we see it. We see it everywhere, actually. But has it really happened? No. So maybe, maybe it's not always as dark as we might think it might be in, in any given moment. So, uh, Chris, we'll we'll dig more into this uh, in the smoke filled room where we're gonna hop in in a second. But uh, we're gonna wind down the main show now. So why don't you just let everybody know where they can dive a lot deeper on this stuff, um, not just on the Secret Sun blog, but uh, I've I've gotten into the Patreon myself recently, and that's where you really get into like a lot of these, these super super deep dives. So just super valuable stuff behind there. Well, just go to secretsun.blogspot.com and that will send, you know, that will link you to the uh, to Patreon and so on. Um, it's again, it's the Secret Sun Institute of Advanced Synchromysticism. And yeah, we've been doing a lot of work, you know, really digging deep. But I, you know, I think it's really important because um, twofold. One is that syn synchronicity itself is. To me, it's a force of nature. You know what I mean? But there, but there's also the idea of sympathetic magic where people are trying to manipulate synchronicity. And that's how I see a lot of these um, uh, big ritual performances, again, at the Super Bowl, World Cup, Commonwealth Games, Olympics, Grammys, Emmys, Oscars, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's been going on for, for quite some time. And um, I think most people are sort of oblivious to it. And if you really need to understand the, the, the details to sort of really figure out what's going on and where it's going. And that's really what we try to do on the uh, Secret Sun Institute. All right, well, I, I've been following the blog for, man, I probably four or five years now. So I, I highly recommend it if you're even remotely interested in this kind of stuff, which I got to imagine if you're still listening at this point, you, you probably are. So check out the Secret Sun blog. Uh, and Chris, thank you so much for coming on my show. Appreciate it. My pleasure. All right, friends. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Chris Knowles. Check out his work at the Secret Sun blog if you enjoy this kind of conversation. He is on top of this stuff all the time. And this conversation kept going in the smoke-filled room, went almost two hours with Chris Knowles. Despite some technical difficulties, we kept plowing away. Plow away we did. And uh, we went even deeper talking about Chris's views on what's really unfolding, where all of this is going to end up going, including his thoughts on the UFO connection. How do UFOs, how does alien disclosure and all of this hype that we're seeing lately tie in to all of this occult propaganda. And as you can expect, it does tend to tie in. As uh, people who've been on the show from the beginning, who've seen all these smoke-filled rooms, I mean, we're telling stories here, and uh, even though it, I haven't necessarily planned it this way, I really feel like we're, if you've been following the show from the beginning, you're getting basically a cohesive a cohesive tale here. So I can't recommend it highly enough. Subscribe Star is how you can get the seven-day trial. So if you just want to check it out, just want to not even take the risk, you know, you got seven days, you could probably pound through all 17 episodes, the extended versions, in a seven-day period if you were really dedicated. So if you just want to give me a shot, head over to Subscribestar. I'll post all the links in the show notes for the show. Again, you can support the show on Patreon, Subscribestar, Rockfin. I do appreciate each and every one of you. You support me in one way or another, whether you're just downloading the show, sharing the show, uh, whether you just fell asleep and you didn't even realize you were listening to the show. It just came up an autoplay. I appreciate you too. I appreciate every single one of you. Until next time, in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.